I was a wee lass, I played this controversial Zelda title in 2011. And I hated it. The motion controls, invasive tutorials, overbearing reminders, constant interruptions, a sickening amount of backtracking, the lack of bird stuff, the absence of an open world, I could go on. But as of September 2022, after beating the HD remaster of Skyward Sword, I'm a changed woman. I like it. While some grievances were addressed, others not so much as it was too deeply etched into the world. Today, I'm sharing my journey of revisiting and learning to enjoy what was once among my least favorite Zelda games. We're hit with some good lore, malevolent forces mounted an assault in order to obtain the ultimate power. But the goddess gathered the remaining humans and sent them skyward, and she remained to restore peace to the surface. Our hero, Link, awakens after having an awful nightmare of a black scaly beast, but brushes it off and moves to prepare for the wing ceremony. After some shenanigans with some shady characters, you take home the idol and get some sweet alone time with your childhood friend, Zelda. However, a dark tornado strikes and knocks Zelda beneath the clouds. What lies beyond, nobody knows. Link's newest companion, Fee, Spirit of the Goddess Sword, serves as Link's guide to the lands beneath the clouds as they hunt for Zelda. The story is very much aligned with most Zelda games. Collect MacGuffins, restore your sword to its true form, gods, Triforce, Ganon, etc. There are a few differences, like Zelda isn't a princess. We focus on the goddess Hylia instead of the old gods. Classic characters make a return, along with a handful of new ones. Groose, a character I originally hated, I... I think I might be more tolerant of him. I mean, he's still ugly as sin, but he comes around and so have I. And we cannot not talk about my darling Girahim, who you'll be coming in contact with frequently. He's fabulous, fierce, and fine. He's a total creep and I'm into it. <laughs> Now I can gush about my daddy demon lord all day, but let's talk about where Skyward Sword gets messy. The motion controls. Like most people, I was thrilled that Skyward Sword HD made motion controls optional. I was ready to bust out that pro controller and poof, just like that 80% of my grievances would disappear. Not quite. The controls felt clunky and off-putting with this new button and stick control. I only allowed myself about two hours before switching to Joy-Cons, and boy is Skyward Sword meant to be played with motion controls. In nearly an instant, everything felt more or less as it should. Being right-handed, my right Joy-Con was my sword, and my left, my shield. Whereas a pro controller, the right analog stick was my sword, and moving it side to side or up and down, it felt like in battle I was on a fast track to wearing down my pro controller. It just didn't feel natural. It was crystal clear that Skyward Sword was meant to be played with motion controls, and it shows, given how a chunk of the tasks utilize motion controls. Fighting, inserting boss carvings, flight, balancing, falling, drawing on walls, swinging, playing music, dousing, the motion controls are shoved in your face. And sometimes, if you moved, your center was off, but thankfully, recalibrating your center is as easy as a push of a button, if you ever find yourself in a mess. And I don't know about you, but motion controls took me a while to get used to. In the early game, my motion control game was off, and that was so frustrating. Listen, I 100% get why people drop Skyward Sword so quickly, because it's such a bizarre learning curve, and if you're not a fan of motion controls already, I don't think this is gonna change your mind. Now, if you can manage to overlook the motion controls and be one with the motion controls, here's what you're in for. You're traveling between three different areas, a forest, mountain, and desert. You'll be going to these areas three times. First, to search for Zelda. Second, to power up your sword. And third, to learn some songs. Sometimes you'll end up fighting familiar faces, each time a little harder than the last but it just kind of feels like padding. Gripe number one that will forever remain is the lack of open world. I remember being disappointed at the clouded segregation. It bothers me less now, probably because I knew what to expect, but I recall my first time being severely disappointed. And three areas seem so little for a Zelda game. Granted, the second time you visit these lands, new areas open up. I will say the second time was very memorable because of one scene in each area, the dreaded Silent Realm where you collect tears while avoiding waking water or being spotted by watchers who will alert the spirit guardians. There is no way to fight back. The only way is to return them to rest. You do that by collecting another tear or rushing back to the safe zone. It was horrifying back in 2011 and it's horrifying now. 
Third time, it's mostly the same areas but you're coming back to it with a twist, like hiding from moblins since you're unarmed. On one hand, I'm impressed they've managed to take the same three areas and make them decently fresh with each visit, with new monsters, change of terrain, and challenges. On the other hand, because there were so little areas, it very much felt super back and forthy. Lots of backtracking through dungeons or areas you've already traveled, just with a twist. But I do gotta admit, it's nice taking down these once tough enemies with ease as you power up your goddess sword. I do like the feeling of progression. Now exploration is made easy with dousing. Select what you want to hunt down, whether it be Zelda, objects, hearts, you name it. However, it cannot be used in dungeons. You could also create beacons to help remember your pathing. Some new things are Link has a stamina meter now. When you run, climb, or lift heavy objects, there are several things to look out for like bugs, critters, and materials to collect and use to upgrade later. And don't worry, unlike the original where you get an item blurb, even after already picking up an item, you only get it once in the HD version. Look out for goddess cubes that unlock chests in Skyloft, butterfly gatherings, a nice callback of Ocarina of Time, play a song to summon a talking stone or a secret wall, and loftwing statues, aka save points. And a new feature is auto-saving. Just walk past the bird statue and it auto-saves. Oh, beautiful addition. I cannot believe how much I've forgotten about these dungeons. They're brilliant. If you are one of the sad souls who have never played a Legend of Zelda game, most of these puzzles are found here. The objective is to go through the dungeon, find keys, unlock doors, progress, find a cool item that helps solve more puzzles, find the boss carving, fight the boss, ta-da, you did it. They did change a tad of the formula. Usually whatever item you gain in that dungeon you use to defeat the boss. Not always the case in this one, and not really a fan of that deviation. Now, the first dungeon is okay, but afterward, it just gets better. Navigating a dungeon by rolling around on a statue's eye, or the one that I hated as a kid, but simply adored playing now, is the desert. Just the entire area. It plays with the idea of past and present so well, and it's just overloaded with clever and satisfying puzzles. Strangely enough, the desert area was the place I got stumped the least, which blew my mind because I was dreading it. And after my first run through, I was itching to go back. And the second time you return to these areas, you're going into new dungeons and they really test you, bringing back old tricks while teaching you new things. Also, loved the classic enemies redesigned for Skyward Sword and its items. Like Armos, hit it with the gust bellows then strike it at its weak point. Just know that anytime you have to go to the desert, you're in for a really great time. If you happen to get stuck, you could speak to Fee, and she'll offer surprisingly helpful advice. She actually got me through a few pickles, which is another boon of the HD version. Fee is way less intrusive this time around. Honestly, I forgot I could seek her advice until two thirds of the game. Now after you're done with that area, you complete the dungeon, it's time to return home to Skyloft. This can be done at an outside bird statue, or exclusive to the remaster, an amiibo, which can send you skyward without needing a bird statue. As you can imagine, this wasn't well received by the community as it's really $15 DLC that should have just been in the game. Anything to get those amiibo sales, I guess. You return to Skyloft to regroup before setting out to the next area. Rather than immediately heading out, I strongly encourage you to take the time to seek out troubled citizens. However, this can only be started by speaking to a monster who wishes to become human. He seeks gratitude crystals, which can only be obtained by helping people. I adored the Skyloft quests. After each story progression, take a look around and see how you can help and score some sweet gratitude crystals. Also, take a look around at the bazaar. There might be a few new things in stock and items to upgrade. You could upgrade your equipment, allowing yourself to hold more bombs, arrows, etc. Your shield durability, yep, this is the Zelda that started that trend, or other pieces of equipment. Potions can be enhanced as well with the use of bugs. And while you're above the clouds, why not fly around Skyloft? Find some islands with some obnoxious minigames and score some rare materials. Overall, the gameplay has absolutely improved with several quality of life changes that drastically improve the experience. This was enhanced so much that Nintendo put out a separate quality of life trailer detailing all the changes. Of course, one of the most notable changes in Skyward Sword is high definition, baby. Skyward Sword looks better than ever, running at a smooth 60 frames per second, and this was something I never noticed until I see a side-by-side -side comparison. 
Playing it on the Wii, I was like, man, this looks great, until you see it in all of its HD glory and you realize it was a muddy mess. It's also worth mentioning that the UI changed. There's no giant Wiimote to the right now. One of my favorite things about Zelda are the NPCs. I love their personalities and their look. I just think Skyward Sword has some of the most animated characters, most notable being the main shopkeeper. He's the dude who's hunched over your shoulder, eager to talk your ear off about anything you might even glance at. And when you turn him down, his friendly facade breaks for a moment before coming right back or you could walk away and watch him sulk. However, while NPCs for the most part look unique and sometimes creepy, the main cast looks awful. Link looks awful, Zelda looks awful, Groose is a menace. For me, it's their lips, too thin and wide. And Zelda's eyes look soulless sometimes. Man, and people like to shit on Girahim. Nah, he's one of the hottest boys in the game. He wears tights so well. And while I have mixed feelings on the graphics, the art is phenomenal. The artistic mind of Takumi Wada gave us these beautiful watercolor illustrations that match the vibrancy of the game. It's bright, beautiful, and gives us that feeling of an epic adventure. I really wish the style would have been translated into the graphics, but that might have been asking too much for the Wii. Does The Legend of Zelda ever have a bad musical score? I don't think so. I found Skyward Sword's OST to be pleasant and it checked the usual boxes. Skyloft theme, sky theme, area themes, different battle themes, and in some places, it was a little harder than the others, like the desert. In the present, the music is hushed, but the second you walk into the active pass, the music becomes lively and louder and it seamlessly blends. Skyward Sword does this a lot, actually. Another example is the bazaar. Depending on who you talk to, you get a different bazaar theme that fits that person's shop. It's a small thing that could easily be overlooked. My favorite instance of this is the battle music. There's the idle variation, then there's when you actually battle. And I love it when you strike an enemy, there's this extra musical emphasis. Or a boss fight when you have a victorious phase and the music turns uplifting and heroic. Ugh, oh, I love it. Now before I get to my favorite track, I want to point out, like most Zeldas, there is a musical element to them. You get an instrument, play these songs that change the world around you, or invoke emotion in people, yada yada. In Skyward Sword you get a harp late game and you learn these songs you hear so little of. It really felt like an afterthought, easily the least memorable songs, and even how you played it just felt… lame. Now my favorite soundtrack is probably the Lizalfos battle theme. These are among my favorite enemies in Zelda, even though they are a bitch to fight in this game. I feel each time I'm about to love Skyward Sword, the motion controls bring me right back to feeling a little aggravated. Listen, I appreciate Nintendo's desire to innovate. It's how we got Splatoon and ARMS. Splatoon 2. But ARMS was very innovative. The Octo expansion. Okay, yes, but ARMS. Splatoon 3. ARMS did. Yo, Splatoon got a manga? But if you can somehow endure the motion controls, you'll get to experience some of the most animated Zelda characters, a beautiful origin story, and brilliant puzzle-solving dungeons. If you're anything like me, someone who hated Skyward Sword on the Wii, please give the HD remaster a chance. It corrects so much and the experience is exponentially better. But if motion controls do manage to scare you away, why not check out my review of The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening remake on the Switch or The Legend of Zelda like game Blossom Tales. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to check out my Patreon for early access to the Discord, early video drops, and postcards. Thank you so much for your support. Mwah!